So I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Susan, Susan Sweeto, who we all know first identified pans and pandas by looking at a subset of children with sudden onset OCD and ticks after um, strep infection. Um, Aspire is really fortunate to have her as one of our founding board members. I don't think we'd be here without her. Um, she is also the chief science officer for Panda's Physician Network. Um, and we love working with them and their incredible organization. So they should be a resource for you as well. Um, she is a board certified pediatrician. She recently retired as chief of the section on behavioral pediatrics of at the National Institute of Mental Health um, after a long prestigious tenure um, there, including establishing a multidisciplinary clinical research team focused on diagnosis and treatment of neuropsychiatric disorders in children. Um, she has co-authored and authored over 100 research papers. Um, so we are fortunate that she is still actively involved in the PANS PANDAS community today, helping us advocate for further understanding and better care for affected patients and all those who take care of those patients. Um, so, and my name is Gabriella True. I'm president of Aspire, which stands for Alliance to Solve PANS and Related Encephalopathies. Like I said, we really appreciate your interest in having us come to talk today. And Dr. Sweeto will provide a talk on PANS PANDAS and all the science and the medical and the treatment um, that incorporates many of the questions that you sent to us in advance. Um, sorry if we don't get to all of them, but um, we will do our best. Um, and then I will talk about for about 20 minutes on PANS in the school setting. Um, so you guys can translate this afterwards and post it on your YouTube channel. So I am going to share the screen now and for Dr. Sweeto to begin her talk, and then I will go forward. Okay. And big view. Takes a moment to actually want to work. All right. You see it now? Yes. Great. Perfect. Okay. So beautiful. Thank you, Gabriella, and thank you, um, Comitato Italia. Buongiorno. That's literally all the uh, Italian that I know, and I messed up your name, so apologies. Um, we're going to go through uh, five major questions today. Um, well, actually, the fifth category is not one question, but several. And as uh, Gabby mentioned, we have gone through the questions that you sent and tried to synthesize them into um, the main thing. I realized after we made our slides together that I had forgotten to indicate how um, families can arrange for private consultation with me and my team. If that's something that people want to do, we can talk about that at the end. So we're going to launch right into what are pans and pandas. And Gabby, if you can give me the next slide. It's just being incredibly slow. Okay. I don't know why. <sighs> Come on, work. I'll do it manually. There we go. Oh, that's going to be a pain for you. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Both PANS, Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome, and PANDAS, Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Strep Infections, are uh, disorders in which there is an unusually abrupt onset of obsessive compulsive disorder. Obsessive compulsive disorder is defined by the presence of recurrent, repetitive, very intrusive thoughts or images um, primarily worries, the child worries that they're going to get sick from something, they worry that something terrible will happen to their parents, they worry that they've been a bad child, they have all kinds of new and unusual um, worries that come in their head, and they may perform rituals in response to them, but for many children, the rituals actually also are inserted just out of the blue so that they suddenly have to repeat things a certain number of times or wash their hands until they get rid of the imaginary germs. Um, and these symptoms in order to be a disorder must take at least an hour a day, cause the child distress 
and get in their way of doing their normal activities. Now you'll see that syndrome and disorder are both capitalized and highlighted here. And the syndrome just means that it's a collection of symptoms and signs that go together frequently. And in this case, it's the obsessive compulsive disorder, it's extreme eating restrictions, and a variety of other symptoms that we're going to talk about. Those symptoms go together in such a way that physicians can recognize them by their abruptness of onset, as well as by their um, sort of unusual nature that the child goes from being a happy-go-lucky seven-year-old to suddenly being plagued and tormented by their thoughts and behaviors. In pandas, oh great, it's correct here. <laughs> in pandas, we have a disorder. The D stands for disorder because there's actually a known disease mechanism. And it's really what distinguishes the two. So pans is the giant category of all children who have a very abrupt onset of their symptoms. And pandas is a smaller group of children in whom their symptoms have been triggered by an abnormal immune response to a group A strep infection. It's probably not important to make that distinction in the average child who becomes ill, um, but if the child has two or three episodes that are clearly triggered by a strep infection, then, um, <clears throat> excuse me, making that distinction that pandas is the problem rather than the larger behavioral syndrome is important so that you can do antibiotic prophylaxis. And actually, um, uh, the work they're done in Italy has shown beautifully that when children have pandas and get put on to antibiotic prophylaxis, they have an 80% chance of moving into remission at the end of their first year of, of illness. So let's move on to the next slide. Who does it affect? This is an unusual psychiatric disorder because it affects very young children. Children as young as age two or three. Um, the youngest that Dr. Rappaport had ever seen had just turned two years old and suddenly started having to walk in circles. Um, many, patient, many physicians might confuse that with autism spectrum disorder. That's one reason we've been interested in both disorders and sort of their connection. They are not the same. And children with autism can get pandas. Children with pandas um, do not also meet criteria for a diagnosis of autism. They are separate but can co-occur in the same child. And typically pandas and pans are going to start later than you would see symptoms of autism. So autism tends to present in the first two years of life, whereas pandas is most common in the grade school age child, particularly kindergarten, first and second grade. It appears to affect all social de demographic groups, all races and ethnicities. It is, it, it is uh, egalitarian in that sense. It does have increased rates in families who have a history of acute rheumatic fever, history of obsessive compulsive disorder, tick disorders, including Tourette syndrome, and the reason for that is that there is a genetic susceptibility to this disorder as shown in the yellow circle. And what you see here is the disease mechanism that we proposed for pandas back in the 1980s and now have had um, almost three decades of research documenting the role of the group A strep of the genetic susceptibility of the nature of that molecular mimicry and then the misdirected immune response. So earlier I had said that it was an abnormal immune response that gave you pandas. It's not abnormal um, on the child's part. It's actually abnormal on because of the strep. Certain strains of the group A strep and only about six to 10 out of the 120 or more strains of strep can cause pandas or rheumatic fever. And that's one reason why physicians get confused because a child can have a strep infection that is um, ter causes a terrible sore throat, but doesn't lead to rheumatic fever. And other children have a strep infection that may even not have symptoms of a sore throat and go on to have pandas. So we have to look at the kind of strep that's causing the infection. The genetically susceptible host is again, not um, appears to just be an abnormality with, uh, not, excuse me, 
not an abnormality, but a subset of healthy individuals in whom their immune response is quite robust against the strep. And then because that group A strep puts proteins and sugars and fats on its cell wall that look like it's human host, when the child's body makes a, a reaction against the strep infection, it um, also recognizes things in the itself in the host that have that same molecular structure. That gives rise to that misdirected immune response and the brain inflammation that's manifest as pandas. Next slide again. So this, uh, the nature of the in brain inflammation is that it affects the base of the brain, the basal ganglia, as well as the frontal cortex. And there's actually signs from Sydenham, Korea that there is inflammation of uh, the, most of the cortex. And so you could see sleep abnormalities, you see somatic abnormalities such as heightened uh, sensory sensitivities, light bothers them, sounds bother them, textures are a huge uh, problem for these children where they suddenly can't wear a tight waistband or they don't wanna wear socks. They might insist on wearing the same silky pair of pajamas every day for months at a time. We have sort of studied this group of children over time and have found uh, that contrary to our initial impression that OCD was the primary problem, that these children actually have several primary problems. Sleep being probably one of the most concerning because it is a sign that this is definitely a form of autoimmune encephalitis. And in fact, when pandas can be documented to have been caused by strep and to have signs of inflammation, it's appropriate to call that disorder autoimmune encephalitis of the basal ganglia. And then that takes away some of the controversy and the, the difficulties that people have with pandas as a diagnosis. The sleep disorders include a new onset of insomnia or uh, where the child can't get to sleep at night. They may wake up in the middle of the night. Some children go from sleeping their normal eight to 10 hours a night to sleeping only one or two hours. And they're truly um, tortured by this because of course they're tired. They might have behavioral regression where they suddenly start talking in baby talk or throwing tantrums. 98% of the children have separation anxiety where they're afraid to be away from one or both parents or from their home. Other things can become a source of separation anxiety. They might not even want to leave their room because it makes them too anxious. And when you look hard, you'll find that nearly all of the affected children have that as a symptom. They also have inability to concentrate, hyperactivity, aggressiveness. So again, this very easygoing model, uh, model student is suddenly up out of their chair causing difficulties. Parents have had an easy time parenting until the pans pandas hits and then suddenly the child is aggressive um, and difficult. Highlighted here are eating disorders and hallucinations because they're two of the more uh, serious symptoms. Eating disorders um, most often are an inability to eat, refusal to eat certain foods, either because they're contaminated or for many children, it's a more classic anorexia where they actually begin to think that they are too fat and they don't want to eat in order to lose weight. The hallucinations, the child can have terrifying uh, images come into their head. They have visual hallucinations, they have auditory or sound hallucinations, and it's important to recognize that this happens in up to 10% of the children because when it, uh, that's a sign of not just a encephalopathic process, but what we would define as delirium and as a, a, a psychiatric emergency that does require use of the psychiatric medications. And we're gonna talk about those more in detail. The only other one that I want to highlight here is over on the right side, the urinary frequency, urgency, and new onset of bedwetting or daytime urinary accidents. That happens in almost 90% of the children. And this would be sort of what we call a pathognomonic or a telltale sign of pandas, pans, because it's so unusual. It doesn't happen in anything else. Anxious children might worry that they need to go to the bathroom, so they'll go more often, but these children actually start 
needing to urinate 10, 15, 20 times an hour. And when we look at the physiology of the urinary tract, it appears that that increased need to urinate may be because the external, excuse me, the internal urinary sphincter has lost its tone. And so the urine is entering into the urethra and triggering that need to avoid. Next slide. <coughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Here in Virginia, we are having horrible allergies this year. All the pollen decided to come at the same time. So my apologies. This slide is very complex and it's uh, complex on purpose because it's just to show you that this pattern of comorbid symptoms could be anything. You could have all greens or you could have green with orange or you could have the, the blues with a few purples. And every child's symptom complex may be specific and unique, but in general, there's a pattern that holds for all the children. And as you saw, most of the kids have most of the symptoms, at least for a short period of time during the illness. Next slide. So as I said, most children have most of the symptoms. Three different sites um, were examined. And for a total of about 120 patients, we found out that uh, comorbid anxiety was the most common, followed by the emotional ability that uh, and irritability where the child is just suddenly on edge and difficult to uh, console. And then the most common and most useful category is those somatic signs and symptoms. So let's go on to the next slide. We talked about these urinary symptoms and I'm glad I put the slide in here because you'll be able to translate it and get everything you need there. Notice at the bottom that the urinalysis is typically normal. It is important to check the urine, um, perhaps even with a culture to make sure the child doesn't have a urinary tract infection because that's the other most common cause of urinary uh, frequency and urgency to go. Next slide. The sleep problems uh, are, as I said, trouble falling asleep. The restless sleep is an interesting one. Uh, parents often uh, report because the child needs to sleep with them uh, because of the separation anxiety, or perhaps the mom or dad is lying down next to the child to help them get to sleep. It's when the child enters that deep stage of sleep known as REM or rapid eye movement sleep that they suddenly start flailing around. And in um, pans pandas, about 80% of the children will have uh, a failure to establish atony during REM sleep. Atony or atonic sleep is when you have paralysis of every uh, all your muscles except for the eye movements, which are uh, moving rapidly, almost like they're following pictures and dreams. And in um, pans, pandas, as well as some other basal ganglia disorders that, um, a tonic state fails and the child continues to move. So you might see them sleepwalking, uh, see them actually having fights or fighting, uh, acting out weird behaviors in their sleep, as well as just tossing and turning. The final one, hyperarousal and hypervigilance and the autonomic dysfunction of the dilated pupils. These are children who are extremely aroused, extremely um, uh, neurologically activated and so their pupils dilate, they have the deer in the headlights look and they have a very um, instinctual uh, basic fight or flight reflex where if they're cornered, if the fears become too great, they will either flee and, and hide underneath a, a table or, or retreat to their room and, and cower in the corner of their bed or they will fight. And this is where they can become incredibly violent and aggressive towards loved ones as well as towards others. Next slide. Here's an example of the motor dysfunction. Uh, in our studies at the NIMH, we fo focused a lot on this dysgraphia, mostly because it provides a beautiful way to go back through that child's history and compare their medical records when they've had strep infections or a sibling has had a strep two times when they have handwriting deteriorations. And if you see two or three of those episodes, then that's a good sign that this child is having a strep-triggered neurologic dysfunction. Next. <clears throat> 
here's a uh, not just example of dysgraphia, but with an inability to draw, but also a behavioral regression where this 10 year old girl's drawing suddenly looks like it was done by a two or three year old, excuse me, three or four year old. And that uh, three or four year old drawing was a good um, representation of how her behavior was during that time as she was talking baby talk, she wanted to play with baby toys that her infant sibling had. And she um, all but uh, moved back to crawling rather than walking. Next slide. Unusual margin drift is um, something that we hadn't really recognized until about a decade ago. And what we see there is that the children just develop left-sided neglect so that their, their sentences and their papers are moving over to the right. And again, this is something that's more useful as you're trying to put the, together the history in your mind and figure out if this episode of behavioral difficulties um, might be related to pans pandas. Next slide. Electroencephalography is uh, an EEG. Um, I think they call them the same in Italy. And we have found that an overnight EEG is the most useful. Uh, but even a routine EEG may show abnormalities in only about one out of five children, about 18% uh, of children. But when they're present, they're quite uh, important because they, rec they represent uh, specific inflammation of the brain manifest as diffuse or focal slowing, spike and sharp wave epileptiform abnormalities. Any of these are abnormal. They are um, transient. They're only present during the acute illness. One of the questions I get asked all the time is if the child's not having symptoms, but we haven't used an immune treatment, isn't their brain rotting away or having ongoing inflammation? And our EEG studies would suggest that this is absolutely not true. That is that what you see is what is happening in that child's brain. So if the child is symptom free, they are also disease free. Next slide. Polysomnography is the way a sleep study, and that's the way that we can find out what's going on during that deep stage of sleep. And what you'll see down here at the bottom is the REM behavior disorder, where they continue to move during their REM sleep or just non-specific REM motor disinhibition is present, excuse me, was present in uh, 10 of the 12 children. And that that study has now been replicated by two other groups documenting that indeed about 80% of children with active pans pandas will have some kind of abnormality on polystomnography. So I know that this is a hard test to get, particularly during COVID, um, but because of the COVID pandemic, many um, sleep uh, study, excuse me, many sleep specialists have now moved to home recordings. So it may be possible to get a, a polysomnography done even during this period of time. Next slide. All right, so the differential diagnosis of PANS, I don't uh, want you guys to memorize this list and look it all up on the internet. That would just scare you to death. Um, let your physician think about that, but I want you to have it want you to keep it in mind that just because it's a sudden onset of behavioral disorders does not mean it's pans pandas. <clears throat> and in fact, there are other dis, uh, diagnoses that not only are more accurate and more appropriate, but more, um, shall we say, desirable because they have a known disease mechanism, unlike pans, and they have a uh, def defined and accepted form of therapy. There are some of the things on this list that if you ignore them, um, they can actually be problematic. So it's important when you first um, seek medical care that you don't go in with a diagnosis. You go in with a set of symptoms and you go in with a set of questions for the doctor. Let them make the diagnosis. You might want to have some of these things. Let's say you have a family history of lupus you have a, um, a sister or an aunt that had lupus, you might want to make sure that you share that information with the pediatrician because otherwise they wouldn't think about it. Similarly, if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis or another kind of thyroid disorder, you would want to make sure that that family history is known to the physician so that they can think about steroid responsive encephalitis with thyroiditis. All of these things are should be known to your primary care provider provider. And there are tests that can be done to look at them. 
One of the most, <clears throat> excuse me, important tests that can be done is a lumbar puncture. <clears throat> excuse me. And I know that people are nervous about that, including the physicians. Um, I personally think it's easier to do a lumbar puncture than it is to do a uh, blood test because you have a bigger area to hit. And we're going to talk more about the importance of the LP later, but I just want to mention it here because it is crucial to making the correct diagnosis out of this list. Next slide. So autoimmune encephalitis, I've mentioned it a couple of times, and this slide is here just so that you know exactly what it is. It's basically any kind of autoimmune. So it could be allergic, it could be a reaction to a toxic material, it could be something like pandas, where you've had a strep infection and you've um, produced abnormal antibodies that then cross-react with the brain tissue and set up an inflammatory response. Or it could be an infection itself. And if there's an actual infection in the brain, that's called just infectious encephalitis, and that requires different kinds of treatment. One of the things that's so difficult about autoimmune encephalitis is that it's really hard to find um, definitive signs that the child has it. Only about one half of children will you have antibodies present that are recognized um, to cause symptomatology. And in the other half, the physicians based on the history will know it's autoimmune encephalitis, but they can't find an antibody, so they can't find a focus of treatment. The autoimmune encephalitis society has become quite sophisticated in dealing with this. They're much more willing to consider the diagnosis in a child that has an abrupt onset of um, behavioral, neurologic, psychiatric symptomatology, and they'll start treatment right away. So um, response to treatment is one of the three ways that uh, the diagnosis of AE can be made. Next slide. So one of the questions that comes up all the time is, is pandas a form of autoimmune encephalitis? And the answer is definitive yes. It's absolutely clear that we have abnormalities of clinical presentation of laboratory and EEG, MRI, PET, and polysomnography abnormalities, even on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, lumbar puncture, and the fact that the disorder improves so greatly with immunomodulatory treatment. Those are all the characteristics and, and re um, criteria required for a diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. And so PANDAS, particularly in the moderately to severely ill child, as I mentioned, should be called autoimmune encephalitis of the basal ganglia. That term was first coined by Russell Dale in the 19, <clears throat> excuse me, in the early 2000s, and it is beginning to take on a greater um, prominence in the in the medical literature. <clears throat> excuse me. Next slide. So our second question was, how do we make the diagnosis? And I've got bad news for you, and that is that this is a clinical diagnosis. There's no specific test for this. Um, we'll talk more about the Cunningham panel later, but all of us in the consortium consider the Cunningham panel to be a useful adjunct, a useful tool, but not a definitive diagnosis, diagnostic um, measure. This paper is available, um, isn't it available at Aspire, Gabby? It is, and it's open, so anybody yeah. can see it. Reasonable. So you can just go to the Aspire website and download this. Um, I think with Google Translate, you can even use that to get some of it into Italian. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is that the uh, diagnosis is made on the basis of the history, the clinical presentation. And I'm just begging you not to um, shade your clinical presentation when you talk to doctors to try and make them fit the PANS uh, picture better because if it's not PANS, it's many other things that are, are probably more easily treatable. Next slide. The medical workup is that comprehensive history. When we do a consultation, uh, we do them virtual consultations now. We actually ask for all the medical records for that child. The family fills out about a 40 page um, historical document for us, as well as numerous questionnaires about the child's behavior. And what you come up with is a very nice, comprehensive picture of how that child was before they got sick, 
how they are now, and how they've been through the course of illness. And as I mentioned at the start of my talk, this is so characteristic that the diagnosis, diagnosis is not hard to make. It just takes a lot of time. So the more you can do for the physician to sort of streamline that by writing a summary, by um, sort of highlighting the periods in which there were very dramatic changes in either capturing video clips or just a, a good word description of what the child was like when they're healthy and what they were like when they were sick. The other tool here is to use your primary care provider because hopefully that physician or uh, practitioner has seen that child for a number of years and has knows them to be a sweet, uh, friendly kid who suddenly is unwilling to make eye contact, is, is seems to be tortured by uh, mental um, obsessions. They're going to do a physical exam, and most important here is to be looking for a hidden strep, mycoplasma, or other infection. Look for choreiform movements. Those are those fine piano playing movements that um, are present only in the stressed posture, but those appear to actually contribute to the handwriting, um, the dysgraphia. So as I mentioned, as you're putting together your packet to talk to the doctor, if you have school journals that show that kind of change, that can be very useful. And then the dilated pupils are another hard physical sign. The physician does need to rule out Sydenham chorea. If these fine piano playing movements are actually more writhing and they're present during periods of rest as well as during stressed postures, then the diagnosis is more appropriately made of Sydenham chorea. And that diagnosis always trumps pandas. Next slide. In a few children, uh, very few, so this is a very low yield but important test. The swallowing study revealed that they were actually having a, a form of Sydenham chorea that's affecting only of the esophagus. The esophagus depends on a coordination of voluntary and involuntary muscle movements in order to facilitate the movement of the food from the back of the mouth down into the stomach. And if that is dysregulated, then they have an, a very appropriate fear of choking because the food isn't actually moving out of their esophagus. But as I mentioned, that's very, very rare, even among children who have a fear of vomiting or choking. Polysomnography, high yield, sometimes hard to get test. EEG, much lower yield, so I would probably do that one um, second. And lumbar puncture in any child in whom you are considering anything more than just non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, even steroids would be okay. But if as soon as you give steroids, then you can't depend on a lumbar puncture. So if there's a, a question in the doctor's mind, should a LP be done or not, it's important to err on the side of doing it, even if the results turn out to be negative. Next slide. Throat culture should be done, not just on the child, but on all the members in the family. A perianal swab, if there's any indication of redness around the rectum. And then anti-streptococcal titers. Very, very problematic. And there were several questions sent to us about the utility of these titers. Bottom line, you can flip a coin and end up with almost as good an answer as you can by doing a strep titer. Because the only ones that we have clinically available are the anti streptolysin O and the anti strep DNA B. Those two tests are positive in only about 60% of children with confirmed throat culture positive group A strep infections. So it's a little better than a coin toss, but not much. And then the other problem with it is that you have as many as 75 to 80% of children who will have a positive strep titer just because they've had a strep at some point in the past six months, year, in some cases, as long as two or three years before that strep titer starts to fall. So titers in and of themselves are not very helpful. If you should happen <coughs> to have a child who presents with a new um, case of pans pandas, and you can get a blood test, uh, since you need one to look for things like thyroid disease and other things, go ahead and do the titers, recognizing that you need to do another set six to eight weeks later to look for a rise in the titers to prove that the strep was causative at that point in time. Next slide. 
Anti-nuclear antibody titers, these are the titers that go up in lupus and other um, autoimmune disorders. They're positive in about 56% uh, of patients with PANDAS during acute flares. Um, and in our last IVIG study that I did at the NIH, I, we found that if you had child had a positive ANA and they had a positive CAM kinase 2 on the Cunningham panel, that was a good predictor of response to the IVIG. I'm not sure it's worth paying out of pocket to get that because um, you aren't getting a lot more information. So I will probably do just the ANA. Now, again, a cautionary note here, ANAs can be positive in somewhere between five and 10% of healthy children, um, just as a function of cross-reactivity of that antibody. So in and of itself, it's not a, a marker of concern, but if you have a positive ANA in a child who's having acute flare, um, it might tip your physician more towards using a, a more aggressive means of immunomodulatory therapy. So we already talked about the Cunningham panel or the molecular lab assay. Um, I don't particularly <laughs> use the cross-reactive titers very much. There's five of them on there. The antitubulin uh, is only a marker for rheumatic fever, so that one's not very helpful. The two anti-dopamine receptor antibody titers, there's now been confirmatory evidence from a second laboratory that those titers might be uh, informative. They tend to be higher in children who have tics and who have the motor symptoms of pans pandas. Um, the one that's the most useful is the CAM kinase 2. And that CAM kinase 2 on the Cunningham panel you're going to get a positive result in anything above 130. But in our research, even research that we did with Dr. Cunningham, we only considered it to be uh, positive and worthy of action if it's 140, 145 or higher. Because that 130 to 145 range um, is the gray zone because there are some healthy non-PANDAS children who tested um, positive in that range. Next slide. So the treatment recommendations. This is my bad uh, picture of a stool, but uh, Gabby made it look beautiful on this slide. The treatment um, is a three-legged stool. It has to be all three things. You have to use traditional psychiatric medications and behavioral interventions. You have to use some kind of antimicrobial if it's PANDAS, and you have to use an immune modulatory treatment. Too many people try to do the treatment with just one arm of that, usually the immune therapies. And that would be like trying to sit on a stool that only had one leg. You can do it, but it's just very hard to balance and you actually are taking away some of the benefits. So we um, wrote an overview. Again, this is at the Aspire website, free for you to use. And the overview was written by myself with Dr. Jenny uh, Frankovic and Tanya Murphy. And the three of us sort of between us have literally thousands of um, patient hours of experience and led the teams that talked about the use of the antimicrobials and the rest. So I actually like this overview because I think it's a nice, relatively short um, piece that tells you what you need to do if you have a child with pans pandas. Next slide. Well, we're going to start with part three, which was uh, Mike Cooperstock's article on treatment and prevention of infections, because for the PANDAS group, this is the thing that will um, produce the best long-term results. I already mentioned that Dr. Uh, Falcini there in uh, Florence had shown that use of prophylactic uh, penicillin could improve symptoms for 80% of the, her patients. And uh, Dr. Cooperstock and his committee really went into a lot of detail as infectious disease specialists to think about which were the best antibiotics to use. Next slide. What they concluded was that uh, three to four weeks of antibiotics at the initial diagnosis, this is longer than a standard course of therapy uh, by about two to three weeks. And the reason for that is that many of these children have an occult or hidden sinusitis. And that if you don't treat that sinusitis with a, an extended course of antibiotics, it just recurs 
work done by uh, Beth Latimer and Earl Harley at Georgetown has documented that the tonsils can also have um, hidden infections and that prolonged course of antibiotics can be very useful in clearing the tonsils. Now, prophylaxis, and that's the long-term use of antibiotics. For some of our children who had to go through plasmapheresis, we treated them just like a child with Sydenham chorea, a rheumatic fever, and they went on antibiotics from the time that we met them until they were 21 years of age. That's what the recommendations are for rheumatic fever. That is the, the simplest antibiotic that can be used, and that's penicillin, either with the IM shots, intramuscular shots, or with oral uh, medication. The important thing there is if you start the prophylaxis, you have to be very, very um, obsessive about uh, giving the medication regularly and on time um, in order to provide the child with protection. But when you do that, our experience with rheumatic fever since the 1950s has shown that the use of the antibiotics is extremely safe, it's effective, and you can prevent future recurrences of the illness. Next slide. So immune therapies tend to be, at least here in the States, the thing that everybody tries to, um, to get for their child. And our, over the years, our opinion of this has, has changed and evolved as we've learned more about the importance of immune therapies. Work done at Stanford by Jenny Frankovic, who led this team, um, is probably been the most useful because her studies have shown that in a child who presents in an acute flare, use of either oral steroids or a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen, naproxen, um, would uh, provide not only a more rapid improvement of that particular episode, but it also prolongs the time until the child becomes uh, has a relapse. Next slide. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, as I talked about, are, are probably the mainstay of treatment for 90 to 95% of children with PANS pandas. These are over-the-counter medications, but we do suggest that they be done only during under a doctor's uh, supervision, because if you uh, put a child on a prolonged course of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, there are risks of kidney uh, dysfunction. So you have to make sure that that child remains adequately hydrated. Um, they must drink sufficient fluids to wash the, the non-steroidals through the kidneys without causing damage. And the other thing is that the non-steroidals uh, thin the stomach uh, lining and put the child at risk for uh, gastritis or stomach inflammation or even gastric bleeding. So we recommend that if the child's going to be started on non-steroidal, uh, which is a six to eight week course, that the simultaneously they receive an acid blocker such as Prilosec, Prevacid, or, or one of the other uh, medications. Some, we for a time even advocated that the children be on what, both of H1 and an H2 blocker. And so that would be an antihistamine as well as the anti-acid medication. Oral steroids um, can be used a short course. So five days, just like you would use to treat an asthma flare. Um, and it's a high dose, one to two milligrams per kilogram for that five days. In general, people who go on to oral steroids are gonna have a kind of a manic -y, trouble sleeping, higher than a kite feeling. Um, in our kids with pandas, they don't have as much trouble with that. So they don't actually have more trouble sleeping. But if you don't see a good response within that first five days of treatment, there's absolutely no reason to consider a longer course of therapy. If you do see a good response after three to five days, and the child has moderately severe symptoms, then a longer course of steroids, perhaps as long as a month within a month's taper, uh, would be appropriate. Intravenous immunoglobulin and therapeutic plasmapheresis. IVIG is actually just starting um, a formal double-blind placebo-controlled trial. We did two trials at the NIH, the first of which uh, Gabby, is that the next slide? I lost my place in the thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, just go back then. The um, 
the plasmapheresis, sorry, IVIG does care, have some risk of infection because of the fact that it's a pooled human donor pr product. Children very often will have uh, severe headache, nausea, vomiting in response to the IVIG treatment. So we only want to do it if it's, it's absolutely necessary. And I would see it as necessary in any child who's having um, symptoms so severe that they can't go to school, that they can't function at home well. And uh, a better <coughs> option, uh, unfortunately much less um, available, is therapeutic plasmapheresis, where it's ba basically a blood blood cleaning procedure. And what you're doing is actually taking out the blood, removing the plasma, which contains these cross-reactive antibodies, and returning um, the formed elements, the red cells, white cells, and platelets to the child with some albumin. Those procedures are done every four to five, excuse me, every other day for either four or five treatments. And at the end of it, you've removed over 90% of the circulating autoantibodies as well as other antibodies. And we had a remarkable um, success rate with that. Our second trial with IVIG failed to show that IVIG was better than placebo. And I could talk for the rest of the day about all the mistakes we made with that trial um, that led to that failed result. But the reality is that that failed study has contributed to the ongoing controversy with pandas and the fact that most insurance companies here in the States won't pay for it. As I mentioned, there's a trial just starting being sponsored by Octagam. Uh, it's anticipated to take at least a year before the study is um, Enrollment is completed and results are known and then another six months to a year before the, um, that becomes available treatment. But in the meantime, this set of recommendations actually provides some good uh, guidance for physicians on how to use IVIG or th therapeutic plasmapheresis. The only other one that's mentioned in here is rituximab. And one of the physicians here in the States depends heavily on use of rituximab. Um, there's only one physician here in the United States that does. Dr. Jenny Frankovic had been very enthusiastic about rituximab, which is a um, monoclonal antibody that actually takes out B cells. And so in theory should be taking out those aberrant clones of the B cells and allowing the child's body to clear those uh, problematic antibodies and not make new ones. The problem is it also takes away all B cells and children of the age who get pans pandas really need those kind of cells in order to fight off the um, typical infections a child is getting. So it's really something to be considered only in a child who's failed other treatments. All of that is detailed in this journal of child and adolescent psychopharmacology in 2017. Next slide. <clears throat> One of the things that makes me very sad in my consultation practice today is when I see a child who's been treated as if they have PANS, PANDAS, for two, three, four years with immune therapies, with antimicrobials of every type, and has not received any psychiatric medications because the parents were convinced that it was PANS, PANDAS. And when I look at the history, there actually wasn't enough um, evidence to suggest that that was true. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, if the child doesn't just have an overnight, very abrupt onset of their symptomatology, a very abrupt change in their ability to function, I wouldn't be pursuing diagnosis of pans pandas. And probably the strongest evidence that we have that uh, supports that statement is this study by Rob Nicholson um, and our group at the NIH published now uh, 22 years ago, which in which we took five children with sort of classic OCD, anxiety, depression. They had comorbid symptoms in addition to their obsessive compulsive disorder, but they did not have an abrupt onset of symptoms. And they went through the same plasmapheresis that had proved to be so useful for our pandas kids and had zero improvement. So when we used the most state-of-the-art uh, treatment that should have resulted in improvement if there was any neuroinflammation contributing to their OCD and they had no uh, benefits, that's good evidence that if you uh, are labeling a child as pans pandas to get a specific set of treatments, it's not going to be helpful. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> so finally, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> 
final in this presentation, but first in the consortium recommendations, and first because we actually think it's the most important, are the psychiatric and behavioral interventions. And as they like to say, this is not rocket science. It's stuff that we've been doing for decades to treat pans, pan, uh, OCD and other disorders. <coughs> Next slide. <coughs> the SSRIs, serotonin reuptake blockers such as fluoxetine, fluvoxamine, sertraline, um, and others are the mainstay of treatment. The Facebook pages and the internet discussion groups are full of reports of how these made the child worse and you should steer away from them in all cases. That has not been our clinical experience at all. And in fact, we see the opposite. I've seen patients whose physicians, well-meaning physicians took them off of SSRIs um, in favor of pursuing an immune treatment course and the child got enough worse that um, they ended up in a psychiatric hospitalization. So SSRIs take a long time to work. You have to be very patient and you have to start at an incredibly low dose because one of the side effects of an SSRI is activation where your nervous system becomes um, activated and on edge. And if you already have a child who's hyper aroused, hyper activated, and you add that SSRI, it can be problematic. So physicians can choose ones that don't have those side effects, start at a very low dose and move up. The anxiolytics are primarily the benzodiazepines and pediatricians and child psychiatrists tend to steer away from these because of the Valley of the Dolls um, and the experience in the 1970s. These are can be addictive drugs, but they're also the drugs of choice to treat the kind of REM behavior disorder that we see in children with pandas. So it, it is an appropriate consideration, particularly if there are abnormalities on that sleep study. Soporifics, those are sleep inducing agents. Um, and next slide. We'll come back to cognitive behavior. Let's go one more, um, Gabby. That would include melatonin um, and a relatively low dose of melatonin, one to two milligrams a night, not up into the five or 10 milligram range recognizing that if you start melatonin, you kind of have to keep it up. And it doesn't make you sleepy. It just in, in, um, sets off the hormonal response in the brain that stimulates sleep. So you need to give it a half hour, 45 minutes, even an hour before the child should be um, going to sleep. Benadryl and other antihistamines have a uh, sort of make you feel sleepy and can make it easier for the child to fall asleep. Again, these can be somewhat habit forming. And so um, I would use, reserve their use just for nights that are particularly problematic. Neuroleptics, we talked about the fact that antipsychotic medicines, um, the same medicines that are used for schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, those are kind of big guns in psychiatric um, pharmacopoeia but they can be quite useful in these children. And the one that actually is most useful is one of the oldest, Haldol. Uh, people are a little bit afraid of Haldol because of its reputation of causing tardive dyskinesias in older schizophrenic patients that were on it for many years. But if you're using it for a relatively short period of time, and particularly in children who have the choreiform movements, they can be really wonderful drugs. Because in addition to being antipsychotics, there are other name is major tranquilizers and they really help with the anxiety. Supportive therapy is key. I think it's important for uh, the parents and the child to get into cognitive behavior therapy as soon as possible. And that was on our previous slide. Uh, we don't have to go back there, but I do want to just mention that CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, and specifically one that's called ERP or exposure with response prevention is the standard of care for obsessive compulsive symptomatology, for anxiety, even for depression. So many, many of the symptoms that these children will have are treatable with cognitive behavior therapy. The problem, during an acute flare, the child is not gonna be available to learn those tools. And so even though you wanna get pursue CBT early in the course of illness, it's unlikely that you, the child will be going for those first few sessions with any benefit, but I would ask the parents to go because what you can learn in that CBT session is how to hold the disease in check. If you ever have any questions about the importance of that, think about Howard Hughes and how with all of his money, he was able to hire 
flanks of lawyers to hand him ever increasingly sterile documents for him to sign. And he became a cripple of his obsessive compulsive disorder because he gave into it. So we do not want to have any um, enabling or um, um, habituation of these behaviors because the parents have had to do it just to sort of survive. If you have a child who has a need for reassurance and they are asking you 24 seven questions and needing you to repeat something exactly the right way, I would give in out of exhaustion and out of love for my child. And so a cognitive behavior therapist can be an incredible ally in helping you know how to not give in to that ritual, not to help it become entrenched, but it still maintain a reasonable parenting relationship to your child. Next slide. So other questions, we've talked a little bit about the Cunningham panel, just to um, summarize that. The Cunningham panel is an incredibly useful adjunctive tool. It's an aid to the diagnosis. It is not the diagnostic test that will tell you whether or not a child has pans pandas. For one thing, it lags behind. So you may send the test uh, this month in March and it shows something high that was actually a function of something that had happened back in January or December. Second piece of it is that it's not a specific more recent research, um, including some work that we did with scientists at Yale has shown that there are other antibodies involved. And until we have a panel that just sort of puts the antibodies against uh, brain tissue of the basal ganglia and looks for the whole panel of antibodies, um, a negative Cunningham panel may not be uh, evidence that the child does not have active pans pandas. And similarly, a positive test doesn't mean that they do. So I said it was a useful tool. When do I find it useful? I actually find it useful when I'm trying to decide if this is the right time to move on to a more intensive um, immune act therapy. So let's say I've had the child on non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or even a longer course of steroids. They're having some response, but not a lot of benefit. I might do a Cunningham panel to see if it's um, if there's a suggestion that moving to intravenous immunoglobulin would be helpful. Role of repeated strep testing. I think I've shared with you why I'm not a huge favor of uh, titers. They're just not very helpful. And most importantly, I've had physicians who said when the titer came back negative, oh, the child can't have pandas. Or if it came back positive, oh, this child has to have pandas absolutely not true. The only thing a ASO or anti-strep DNA-SB can tell you is that that child has had a strep infection sometime in the past. Whether that strep infection was one that caused pandas or not cannot be determined by the titer. Then uh, cultures, I do think cultures are useful and so is the history. In our very first study of pans pandas, we actually had to go back to uh, look at what is going on in the siblings, in classmates of the children, because this, <clears throat> the infection that causes the problems that result in pandas may well not cause symptoms of a sore throat, fever, headache, or stomach ache, the other classic symptoms of a strep infection. So what other tests are important to run? We talked about the ANA. If I was gonna do a panel on the child, what I would do is do a, what's called a complete blood count, look to make sure that they're not anemic, look at ferritin to make sure that they don't have an iron deficiency that could can be contributing to their restless sleep. I would want to know that they had normal immunoglobulin levels, quantitative immunoglobulins uh, with subclasses of IgG. So that gives you IgA, IgM, IgG, IgD. And if those are all relatively normal, then you do not have an immunodeficiency, and then you can continue to consider the diagnosis of pans pandas. If any of those are lacking, particularly IgA, then that is a counter um, indication, contraindication to treatment with IVIG and some others. If you have low immunoglobulins, IgG, then the physician needs to be um, knowledgeable enough to sort out is that just a temporary immunodeficiency caused by a recent viral infection, or could this represent a real um, IgG subclass deficiency? 
And if it's the latter, if you have an IgG deficiency, then IVIG might be the treatment of choice. Complement um, C-reactive protein, sedimentation rate, other markers of acute reactant, reactant um, immune reactants are, are helpful to have because they typically are normal and it's reassuring as we think about that differential diagnosis, but they can't tell you whether or not the child has pandas, so those might be skipped. And then um, just again, circle back to that ANA. I think that that's kind of a useful, albeit very nonspecific mm -hmm. test. All right, some other questions, and then I'll let you guys ask questions as, as you have, or actually we'll move you to- You actually have, it. there's more than one page of questions. Oh, good. <laughs> and then we have to do some school stuff, so we yeah. won't be getting to questions for a bit. So the relationship between pandas and Tourette syndrome, um, I loved this question because the, the reality is they're both the same thing. Remember we talked about that giant universe of children with obsessive compulsive disorder, and some of them had acute onset, so they would be defined as PANS, and then an even smaller group had um, acute onset related to strep infections, and they were the PANDAs. Exactly the same thing goes for Tourette's syndrome. Tourette's syndrome, by definition, is merely the presence of one, excuse me, yeah, one vocal tick and at least one motor tick for one year. So it's just as much a behavioral description as is PANS. It's just that because the neurologists tend to um, think of the syndrome of Tourette's as a disorder, that things get a little complicated. The bottom line is if a child has had tics, motor and vocal tics for at least a year, they have Tourette's. And that's all they, that they have is chronic tics. Many children with Tourette's also have ADHD. They also have OCD. And all of that is related to dysfunction within the basal ganglion, the same region of the brain that's affected in pandas. So if a child with pandas has an extended course that includes um, motor and vocal tics, they will meet criteria for Tourette's syndrome as well. No problem with giving them that second diagnosis, but just so you know, it doesn't impact their prognosis, does not impact their outcome. Just because you have Tourette's does not mean you're going to end up um, with uh, swearing and cursing and horrific tic disorders. So um, the other one that should be on there, and Gabby, is it on the next slide? I didn't look. Is relationship between pandas and autism? Do I do that one next? You can do that now. It's not on there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the same, same exact scenario goes with pandas and autism, except that those two disorders are not the same, right? So pandas and Tourette's are just different labels for the same symptoms. Autism and pandas are very often happening in the same child, probably because it's the same areas of the brain that are affected, but they're different and separate disorders. So a child with autism is going along, doing very well, and then they just fall off the rails. They suddenly start having terrible stims, terrible repetitive rituals, aggressive behavior. Um, and they're, if they're nonverbal and they can't tell you about their anxiety, they still might have that deer in the headlights appearance, or they might have trouble sleeping for the first time. They might have a return of incontinence. All kinds of behaviors can be manifest that if it was in a neurotypical child, you would have no problem making the diagnosis of pandas. Should have that same approach in the child with autism and perhaps be even more vigilant for it in them since the, the comorbidities are more frequent. The reverse is not necessarily true. It is not at all true that having pandas early in childhood will lead to a diagnosis of autism. The chronic symptoms that can result from pandas are not um, social uh, withdrawal and failure of social communication, they may withdraw due to anxiety, but the chronic symptoms of pandas are obsessive compulsive disorder, tics, and anxiety. All right, question about should the less severe pans cases be treated? I am a firm believer that symptoms should be treated. So you would look at that stool and you would say, okay, if it's just PANS, I probably can skip the antibiotics because they're not going to be helpful. I found no evidence that infection played a role in the onset of this child's illness. So we won't use that. We might need to use non-steroidals because there is evidence of inflammation. 
and we may need to use some cognitive behavior therapy. I'd probably hold off on use of an SSRI if the child's still able to go to school and is just having a few um, symptoms a day. And I'm actually thinking right now of a little boy that I just um, met from New Mexico who fit that pattern exactly. He was having intrusive thoughts where he would see somebody's bottom, even though they were fully clothed. It was embarrassing to him. He would sort of need to go run and tell his mom, but it was only happening a few times a day. We did the lab workup. We made sure that there wasn't anything else going on. And then we just treated him with um, a month of non anti-inflammatories and some reassurance and some cognitive behavior techniques, not even with a therapist, just with one of the available resources from the Obsessive Compulsive Foundation, International Obsessive Compulsive Foundation or IOCDF. You do not need to treat PANS, PANDAS, and, and specifically I'm thinking about PANDAS. You do not need to treat PANDAS to prevent future brain injury. As I've already mentioned, if the child's symptoms are gone, the inflammation is gone. And what can parents say to doctors that say, oh, these are just a mental illness or just behavioral, or as you would hear here in the United States, PANDAS, PANDAS, <coughs> that's controversial. I don't even think it exists. And they will point you to several, um, editorials, as well as the most recent uh, version of the American Academy of Pediatrics Red Book. That's why I urge you not to use PANS PANDAS when you're talking with the physicians. Just talk about the symptoms, obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety disorders, attention deficit hyperactivity disorders, urinary incontinence, urinary frequency, urinary urgency, insomnia, all of those are very real terms. And if your physician is savvy and open enough to consider that as a constellation of symptoms that fit under the PANS umbrella, great. Um, but it's not essential that you get that diagnosis in order to um, get appropriate treatment. We already asked the question about private consult and the answer is yes. The way to get that is just to um, Google Sweeto, uh, Healthy Foundations or Sweeto Heartwood, H-E-A-R-T-W-O-O-D, -E PANS PANDAS program, and then just follow the links. You do, because we have no translators available, it would need to be a consultation in English. And for international families, we prefer that the uh, a referring physician be on the call for the uh, recommendations phase because we don't have the ability to implement treatment internationally. Also, if you click on the search bar on the aspire.care website and type in Heartwood, it'll come up on there, a link Great. to it, Thanks. and it's very easy to find that way. Um, and I can send a link to Stefania after the call. Thank you so much, Gabby. All right, next slide. <clears throat> Is that I think oh. you've answered a lot of these. Um, yep. I put them in just in case. Okay, great. So you can scan them. I think basically they, there a lot of questions were around the use of prophylactic antibiotics for strep and is it safe? Um, and then if you would use a prophylactic in the presence of a mycoplasma pneumonia infection, for example, um, I think those were some of the, and if antibiotics, if it just didn't work, would how, what would you do? Would you move on to a different antibiotic or what would you do next? Okay, so let's just dive into that a little bit. Thank you, Gabby, for sort of summarizing those questions. The bottom line is in the consortium's recommendations, and it took almost two years for um, our group to really hammer all of this out, look at the data that we had, clinical experience. The recommendation is that you try initially a three to four week course of an antibiotic known to be effective against strep, if the child has had symptoms of, uh, consistent with mycoplasma, then you need to have an antibiotic that would also address mycoplasma. That antibiotic in Dr. Cooperstock's mind should be a cephalosporin, the first round. Um, a cephalosporin, it would be like Keflex or some of the others. And those medications are similar to penicillin, but they're a little bit uh, more powerful against strep and some of the respiratory bacteria. That one month course, um, you might see a minimal degree of improvement. 
And the decision about whether or not to continue that antibiotic, move to a different antibiotic, really depends on how strong the history was of infection as the inciting um, agent for the acute symptom onset. If there's no history of exposure or infection, um, particularly bacterial infections such as strep or mycoplasma, then the one month course would probably be the only thing I would use even if the child had not responded. We typically don't use antibiotics by themselves though. We would typically have that initial course of treatment be a month of nine steroidals plus antibiotics. And if you don't see response to that, then uh, it really requires a, a more in-depth assessment at that point to decide is there, is there any immune or uh, infectious component to this illness because the, those two treatments should have addressed um, the vast majority of things that could be contributing to a pans pandas infectious autoimmune uh, picture. Use of prophylaxis is only, absolutely only indicated in children who have fully meet criteria for pandas. For group A strep triggered onset and at least one more exacerbation of neuropsychiatric symptomatology. <clears throat> the reason for this is because that's the group that we studied at the NIH that's the group that's most closely related to rheumatic fever, and that's the group in whom that prophylaxis has a chance of preventing future episodes of illness. That's all it can do. It can't uh, treat the symptoms. It can just allow the symptoms to improve, disappear on their own, and then prevent the child from having another relapse. And the best antibiotics for that is good old penicillin, IM or oral. Um, and then if the child is allergic to penicillin, you might be able to use azithromycin or one of the uh, erythromycin family. You might be able to use a cephalosporin. Unfortunately, there's some cross-reactivity. So if a child is allergic, to, truly allergic to amoxicillin penicillin, then they uh, have a higher chance of also being allergic to cephalosporin and azithromycin. And you'd probably have to work with an infectious disease doctor to make that determination. I said truly allergic because uh, particularly in young children, you know, when they get their ear infections at a year, 18 months of age, and then they get that fine red rash all over their body. People say, oh, is it amoxicillin rash? And that is true. The amoxicillin tends to bring out that dermatitis, but it's not an allergic response. Allergic response to antibiotics, <clears throat> excuse me, would be hives, big blotchy um, rash, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, and then we just talked about, um, if you are using prophylaxis, penicillin is the, is the disorder, is the antibiotic, of choice because penicillin, every gut bacteria is already resistant to it. So the use of probiotics and prebiotics and other things to protect the uh, gut flora aren't as necessary with penicillin as they would be with azithromycin or even with the cephalosporins. Next slide. Treating viral triggers like herpes. Um, there are a lot of of practitioners in the United States that are blaming PANS on herpes. The reality is there is absolutely no evidence that it gives you a PANS pandas picture. If anything, if you had a herpes infection of the brain, you would be very sick with herpes encephalitis. If you uh, just have positive herpes titers, positive HSV, positive Epstein-Barr, positive many, many things, that's just because you're alive. These viruses are so ubiquitous that uh, the chances of a child having a positive titer are quite high and it's actually a good sign that their immune system is functioning properly. So do not treat pans panda symptoms with antiviral medications. The only exception to that would be a child in whom there was a clear um, sort of pandas picture and then the antibody response um, generalized so that any infection, any immune uh, stimulant makes that child flare again. In those children, if they have symptomatic uh, cold sores or other manifestations of herpes, they might need to have an antiviral for a short period of time. <clears throat> 
but I hope that I never see another pans pandas child that's been on antivirals for two or three years. They're just not useful. Can you confirm that one can flare from dental issues? Absolutely possible, including just loose teeth. Tanya Murphy did a little, uh, kept track of these and, and presented a case series at one of our meetings where one of the reasons that her seven-year-olds were flaring was because they would have a loose tooth and you know how kids just play with it and play with it and play with it until it finally comes out. Every time they're playing with it, they're actually seeding uh, bacteria into the bloodstream and, and causing an inflammatory uh, response, very normal, healthy inflammatory response, but it can also trigger the flares. You treat it as you would any other kind of flare without a known provo um, provo provocation, and that would be, again, antibiotics and immune therapy. And the other reason um, I'm glad this is in here is if that child has already had their initial episode and they were engaged in cognitive behavior therapy, they should have the tools on board so that as soon as they finish, excuse me, as soon as they feel their symptoms coming back, they can um, start employing the CBT and, and fight it off before it becomes problematic. What if the next trigger is not virus, bacteria, but something else, let's say it's a terrible psychosocial stress, a grandparent dies, they have to move, parents are getting divorced. All of those things open the blood-brain barrier by releasing epinephrine and can trigger a flare that looks identical to those that are caused by an infection. Um, the treatment in those cases is not depending on antibiotics because there's not an infectious trigger, but may well depend on stepping up the aggressiveness of the immune-mediated uh, treatment as all of the anti-inflammatories also help to close down that blood-brain barrier and restore it to um, its ability to block entry into the central nervous system. Plasmapheresis and IVIG should be reserved for the sickest of the sick. Uh, we just did a little survey of the consortium members, which is 30 institutions, academic institutions in the United States, everything from Harvard and Yale to Stanford in the West. And among the 30 uh, institutions recommend represented there, IVIG was used in less than 10% of the clinic patients. And to get into one of those clinics, you have to be pretty sick. So it's, it's used relatively rarely and plasmapheresis even less than that. Now, I had an opportunity to visit um, Dr. Russell Dale down in Sydney, Australia. He turns to plasmapheresis a little more often and has superb results. So um, I think at the point that a child is not functioning, has severe illness, then IVIG are appropriate. Um, you definitely can have an anaphylactic reaction to intravenous immunoglobulin. It's one of the known uh, adverse effects. And because it is known, the children are typically premedicated. They are monitored very closely during the infusion. The infusion gets stopped. Appropriate anaphylactic treatment is uh, provided, and the child does quite well. But they shouldn't get any more IVIG. Uh, differences between treatment of pandas and pans. That is a wonderful question. And um, it took a lot of pushing um, of the consortium on me for me to agree that we could treat pans the same as pandas because we knew what happened when you treated pandas with the things we've been talking about. We had no data on the treatment of pans. And what became clear after the original meeting in 2013 as people began to gather their data and we've now had almost a decade of experience was that pans will respond the same and that you can treat pans as if it's a pandas with that one exception that I mentioned. There's no role for long-term antibiotic prophylaxis in pans, only in pandas. Tonsillectomy, mm. well, if pans pandas is controversial, the topic of tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy is even more controversial. And uh, because the consortium is such a a congenial group <laughs> of collaborators, uh, we only discuss, we don't fight like we do with some of the anti-pandist folks. Um, the bottom line is that you really have to follow your physician's direction on this. I'll give you the evidence on both sides. So the pro-tonsillectomy group is led by uh, Harley and Latimer at Georgetown. Their experience has been that if you do tonsillectomy before treatment with IVIG, the children have a better chance of um, improving than if they don't. 
The problem with that experience is it's totally based on Dr. Latimer's clinical experience, and she does not have systematic follow-up data available, nor does she keep systematic records of sort of severity and the rest as she goes into it. So that's completely clinic, clinical anecdotes, but, but pretty powerful based on the numbers that they have. And the fact that when Dr. Harley did the tonsillectomies and sent the samples to Minnesota, they found that not only were there aberrant or abnormal uh, clones of, excuse me, uh, colonies of bacteria in deep in the tonsils, but also that the immune cells within those tonsils was different than it was for kids who were getting their tonsils out because they'd had frequent strep or they had obstructive sleep apnea. So pretty strong evidence in favor of tonsillectomy as a useful tool in the, the treatment of pans pandas. The opposite side is also anecdotal because Dr. Murphy and I just uh, were watching in our clinics and what we found was that we had a higher than expected rate of children who had their first episode of pandas and then more frequent episodes among kids who had had a tonsillectomy adenoidectomy for either frequent streps or obstructive sleep apnea. And it seemed that the tonsils were doing their job of getting inflamed and sore. And so they caused you to have a sore throat that then got a culture and got treatment in a timely enough fashion. And when those tonsils were gone and you didn't have that uh, indicator of infection that the infection could linger and produce the cross reactivity. So I must confess that I don't think that um, we know whether tonsillectomy is helpful. And finally, how do you prevent the next flare? Prevent, uh, I, <clears throat> in pandas, you may be able to prevent the next flare with use of prophylactic antibiotics. We were able to reduce the number in one trial to uh, zero, number zero strep infections, but we only reduced the number of flares by about two thirds to three quarters. So we would have expected two to three episodes per uh, child in the coming year. And we actually saw only one uh, flare in every two to three children in the coming year. So it can be effective. And as I've already mentioned several times now, I've been impressed with the work of Dr. Fernando Falcini there in Italy showing that use of long-term antibiotics can be very helpful in preventing the next flare. Prompt treatment with steroids or uh, non-steroidals in Dr. Franco's work at Stanford has also been shown to be helpful in preventing the next flare. I think this is the next one's the last slide, right, Gabby? Um, yeah, that was, it was in your slide share. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this one was just to remind you of the sort of multiphasic um, nature of the treatment of pans pandas. And when I said it's a three-legged stool and that you need to use all three, the reason is because the antibiotics are um, really focusing on the cause the immune therapy is focusing on what's wrong with the brain, and then the psychiatric uh, medications and the cognitive behavior therapy are focusing on the treatment. And the best analogy here is pneumonia in a child with asthma, in which you have to treat the infection that's causing the pneumonia with antibiotics. You have to treat the, the constriction of their airways with steroids and with excuse me, aerosol treatments that can reopen beta blockers and others to reopen those uh, constricted airways. And then you actually have to provide the child with some relief. And that might be a, an emergency inhaler for times when they're having severe coughing spasms or even use of a cough suppressant. So the same kind of multifaceted treatment is appropriate in pans pandas as is appropriate in any immune uh, mediated disorder of, of our bodies. Okay, Gabby, can I turn it over to you now? Yes, thank you Yay. so much. Um, I always learn something new <laughs> from a Dr. Sredo talk. Um, there were a couple of things I was like, oh, I did not know what that, that was. Um, so I'm really excited to go back and listen to it and you know, like log it into my brain for future. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I always appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna go 
into a school overview. I understand from Stefania that a lot of the Italian schools do not provide much support and accommodations for your students, except for a few diagnoses like ADHD and dyscalculia, um, which are can be you know seen in PAMs, but um, things like the tics and the OCDs and the eating disorders are not being supported at sc school for anybody. Um, so I'm not. Um, so I can well imagine that this is an uphill battle trying to explain pans pandas and we'll talk a little bit about that um, and how brain inflammation can affect these behaviors and le their learning. So I'm going to provide you a highly edited version of one of our school lectures, um, but it'll give you an overview. Um, so I'm going to start with a brief interview. My slides always have a ton of words um, in them because I find in the US they go back to the slides they give them, give, and they use it sort of as a book. Um, but I'm gonna give you an overview and then I'm gonna go in um, into more detail. Um, so I'm gonna just sort of go through this section and then I'll give more detail. Um, you know, as Dr. Sweeto has been discussing, PANS is a medical, um, medical disorder and it's really quite complex. Um, and PANS treatment requires that three-pronged stool of um, a, you know, a treatment protocol. Help from school falls under that psychotherapeutic arm. Um, wow. So schools really should be a component of that therapeutic process. And therefore, almost all kids will need some amount of support to help them learn, no matter their severity. Um, PAN manifests itself in many different ways, ranging from physical to neurological to behavioral symptoms. So students will be affected across multiple domains of learning and their ability to learn and function can be significantly impacted. So not all behaviors, especially during the flare, the height of the flare are gonna be choice-based. This con is a concept that schools have a really hard time grasping, um, which is why it's so important for them to understand neuroinflammation and how it affects the basal ganglia and all it alters our students' typical functioning. And because PANDAS is relapsing or remitting, functioning can change rapidly, especially when exposed to an, another illness or another trigger, which is one reason that flexibility in school planning is essential. Um, attendance can be greatly impacted, but our goal is to keep students in school as much as possible. Um, communication is critical between parents, schools, and the providers because um, it can't be just on the doctors, it can't be just on the school, and it can't be just on you as parents. So we really want to be able to communicate um, about everything with the schools. So how do we start thinking about ways to support these students with PANS PANDAS? We start by looking at how the disorder impacts learning and functioning. So these are seven key areas of functioning that PANS can impact. Fine motor skills and visual motor integration, visual processing, receptive language, including auditory processing, expressive language, visual and auditory memory, executive functioning skills, and sensory integration. So when we translate this into what we may see in the classroom, we find that these impact multiple domains of learning. Um, this includes social behavioral, cognitive, academic, sensory motor, and executive functioning. Um, when I'm speaking to a school, I go into quite a bit of detail on these slides. Um, this is really when I talk a lot about what the symptoms actually look like, um, because it's one thing to say a kid has OCD, um, but the truth is a lot of schools don't know what OCD is. They think it may just be hand washing or lining things up. So we talk a lot about what it really could look like in that classroom. Um, anyway, um, because saying that an o OCD, anxiety, or urinary frequency really doesn't give them a full picture of what is happening with that student. Um, but since you were parents, you have a firmer grasp of what this looks like. Um, but I'll just give you an example of what I might say in a school. Um, a lot of times when I'm talking to a school, they've given me sort of a download on what their student or students with PANS looks like so that we can focus on some of that. Um, but a student, so for example, I would say student social and behavioral skills are impacted by obsessive compulsive disorder. They may be unable to stop disruptive behaviors due to inappropriate obsessive thinking or their separation anxiety may be so debilitating that they're not able to attend school during the height of the flare. Um, 
so we may see a lot of cognitive and academic regression as the decline in academic skills are a major symptom category for pans pandas. In this domain, we not only see loss of math skills, but we can see perfectionism due to OCT, which can result in a student erasing work over and over to get it just right. Um, or they may have trouble handing work in on time because they are afraid to get it wrong, or they have a need to constant check, or their handwriting skills like Sue showed you those examples of may change overnight going from legible to illegible at the onset of the flare. Um, so if you're trying to get support from school, um, just give me one second. Um, my whole thing just jumped 20 pages. Um, no. um, so if we're trying to get support from school, go through these domains um, and plug in what your symptom, your child's symptoms are. So, um, and how they affect learning. Lay each symptom out for all of them. So if you know that they've declined in schoolwork, how, what's declined? Is it and you may need to work with your doctors on this. You may need to work on your therapist of planning this all out. But when you, if you go into school with it all laid out, like this is what's happening with their executive functioning. They are having time management skills, blah, blah, blah. They're difficult to making decisions. Um, sometimes they have a hard time in gym class because they have an unusual gait or they're balanced. They're having a lot of balance issues. So you want to figure out, walk that kid through their day at school and plug in where they're having um, issues, okay? So you, here we would call that their sort of present levels of performance at school. Where are they presently? Um, and another thing you're gonna wanna know is how severe your child is, right? You're gonna be able to want to express that to the school. So again, working with your doctor um, about you know, being realistic, or is your child mild, moderate, severe? I mean, it's usually pretty obvious, but you wanna be able to talk about that and how it affects them at school. So if your child has mild symptoms, they may really only need um, classroom strategies to accommodate these episodic symptoms. The school might not really have to do that much. A really good teacher probably should be able to handle some things um, as long as they're aware that they need to try to handle them. And as Dr. Sweeta was saying, you know, try to be on board of not feeding every single one of their OCD um, obsessive thoughts. Um, but if your child has moderate to severe symptoms, they are gonna require more support because their symptoms and health issues are more greatly impacted. Um, and so their school performance and ability to learn and even attend school is gonna be impacted. And then there's the student with severe symptoms. And a lot of these kids aren't attending school. Um, they Maybe they're not attending school for a long time or maybe it's just a short time depending on how quick they can access therapy and how quickly it works. Um, so, here that what happens with those students it kind of ha what happens on a range some kids are getting um school to do some tutoring some parents have just pulled their child all together from school for a while but ultimately a lot of the focus is on healing and treating that kid um but when they get back to school when they get better we need schools to be able to provide extra help so students can relearn skills if they are not able to go back to baseline on their own. Um, some kids do return to baseline between flares, some do not, depends on what the um, symptom is. And they're gonna need extra time to learn new material that they may have missed while they were really sick and not able to access the curriculum, okay? Um, so after categorizing how our students' symptoms have impacted their learning, we can focus on support. Um, so before I go into specific symptom support, let's step back and look at overall general principles that teachers and educators and school staff should be aware of. Um, often support teachers are using for students look a lot like what they're using currently for other disorders like tics, like ADHD, like OCD. Um, it depends on the teacher. Some teachers have more experience than others on that, but they are utilizing in general, some of those key concepts. Um, and I, 
I know some of your teachers aren't very supportive. So um, that'll, they may have a large learning curve. Um, but unlike if a kid quote unquote just has ADHD or just has OCD, our kids with Pans Pandas are having a multiple symptoms. If you go back to Dr. Sweeto's chart with the circle and um, the symptoms all around it, like a daisy, um, these kids are coming in with a lot of different symptoms and a lot of different areas of need. So teachers are, and schools are gonna have to layer multiple layers of support to create a customized plan for a kiddo, um, just like medical treatment um, supports and all these must be individualized and there's not always a one size fits all. Um, so another thing that's a little bit different than other single disorders is that what may work for one student in the fall may not work for them at another flare. Um, so it may not work consistently the whole year. So if they have a flare in the fall, for example, and then get better with treatment, but then flare again from exposure to something else in the spring, the accommodations during those two flares may be different. Um, so flexibility on how they're supported is gonna be needed. Um, also, schools are used to working towards getting better getting towards an uphill trajectory of skill uh, attainment. So they start off not really knowing how to do something and we they are gradually teaching them and eventually they meet that goal and then you work on something new. But due to the relapsing and remedy nature of PANS and the fact that treatment and recovery can also be sawtooth, which is jagged, um, a student may make progress towards a, a goal, then they flare and then suddenly fall below baseline again and have to start learning those skills again. Um, and sometimes during the flare, they really just need a support, sort of like a bridge to get them across the bridge when the suddenly there's a big cavern beneath their feet. They can no longer add two plus two out of suddenly. They knew it last week, but they don't know it this week. Um, just to get them through, to keep their stress manageable um, and keep them therapeutically getting better and not completely frazzled all day long, let's give them a support, like a calculator. Let's give them time to have a timeout. Let's give them some sort of fidget tool if they are getting really having a lot of ADHDs. Move their seat closer to the teacher if they need more one-on-one -on -one support. Um, and then once treatment works, we need to remove a lot of those supports so they're not relying on them for no reason. And then work if they need to work on regaining skills on their own. And they'll also need remedial help to relearn them and then to make up for lost time, okay? Um, positive reinforcement strategies, because we, as we all know, there's a lot of behavioral issues that come with pants pandas. So there's a book by a man named Ross Green. Um, and he, and a lot of schools and use a lot of his strategies in the United States. So um, I'd like to remind at least the American teachers of this, that children do well when they can. Um, Essentially, if a student could do well, they would do well. If there's a barrier keeping them from doing well, let's identify it, let's address it, but let's assume good faith on the part of the student that they don't wanna be a bad kid. They don't wanna have an outburst. They're not sitting there thinking, how can I disrupt everything? Um, so also when we're looking at the behavioral picture, it can be helpful to draw for draw from what we know from traumatic brain injury um, and other neurological disorders. Schools often will have some tools in their pockets to be able to handle kids with those issues. Um, and then it is often more beneficial to manage the environment and the antecedents and avoid triggers rather than expect that student to manage the behaviors appropriately once they're upset. Um, so that would involve the teacher and the school looking at that kid's day. If they're consistently getting upset due to sensory overload issues in a very loud lunchroom, how can we 
have them have lunch maybe somewhere else with a small group of friends so that they are not overstimulated if they're you know that's just an example but they want to be if gym class is too loud maybe they do something else that um, is physically helpful for that kid but not with a hundred kids screaming around um, but you know having a strong trusting communication between family and doctors is key to helping determine what are choice-based behaviors and what are neurological symptoms um, because as Dr. Suido was talking about with the CBT and the ERP therapy during that height of the flare these kids aren't addressing the behaviors at that time isn't always that beneficial. The kid isn't really able to respond to that. Do we want to allow all of it? No, which is one of the reasons we try to control the environment so it doesn't happen. Um, but it can be often hard to tell what is choice behavior based behavior and what isn't. So working with and having that communication between the family and the doctors and the school is, is critical um, because the team together will hopefully be able to determine what is choice-based and what are neurological symptoms. It really shouldn't just be on one person's shoulders um, unless they're really, really good at that. Um, and you know, this can determine, determine is that student talking inappropriately? Or is he experiencing neurological issues that affect his impulse control? Is that student shouting out unusual words because they are angry and wanting to be disruptive or because they're experiencing a vocal tick or have an inability to control obsessive thought? Is it worth accommodating that OCD symptom for a time being um, if it's gonna mean that student is successful and able to remain in school? Um, your school's response is going to be different depending on how you characterize those behaviors and the degree of control the child has over there and where they are in their illness. Um, ultimately, you know, the more the students are in classrooms that are sensitive and responsive um, to their experiences, the better prepared schools are to support the needs that are a function of this illness, um, which leads us to a flexible curriculum. Um, I could say flexibility, flexibility a hundred times in a talk um, because really it's essential. I mean, a hallmark of pan pandas, as we all know, is to go from top grades to multiple daily living challenges in just a couple of days or over the week. Um, it is very common who, to have a student who is functioning on Monday be in a very, very different place at school by Friday or even Tuesday. Um, conversely, um, they may start a medication that works quickly and they're back to functioning a week. I mean, we would love that to happen for every kid that it would happen that quickly, but it, so it can. So schools are going to need to be able to move quickly to change or adjust services, adjust supports really quickly. Um, we also want to talk to schools when we have calmer times to be able to plan for that worst flare we always are hoping for the best that we won't have to go down this path again. But um, it's helpful for parents to have the comfort of knowing that the school is going to be able to respond. What will they do if this happens? What could they do if something else happens? So, you know, it's worth once you get them on the hook to actually helping, um, it can be good to sort of look ahead and think for the future. Attendance. Um, you're going to see quite a few slides on here because when I get called into a school, often there's big attendance issues um, with zero understanding of why. Of course, our goal is always to keep them in school and get them back to school as quickly as possible. Um, but Almost every pan, single pans kid at one point is too debilitated to attend school. Even some of these really low symptomatic kids. Um, so this, this looks like a really extreme um, statistic that 90 to 100% of kids are gonna experience attendance issues. This number encompasses a wide range. This encompasses a kid who missed one day of school to, because of their OCD, or they missed 
five weeks of school due to their OCD. Um, but what is a sort of a more useful number is that this one study showed that 50%, so half of the children with Pans Pandas spent time on home instruction or were removed permanently for school. Um, sometimes that's a parent's choice. Sometimes that's the school's inability to care or help at all. And so this kid is being subjected to a pretty unfriendly, unhelpful environment. So the parent chooses to make that choice. Whereas other schools that really work hard on helping that kid and figuring out best ways for that kid to learn, um, they do have a better um, rate of staying in school. But sometimes they're truly, truly, if they're severely sick, um, they're not able to learn. Um, and sometimes for some families, it's worth going ahead and sending them into school, even though they know that child isn't really accessing the curriculum and learning a lot, but they're getting the kid in school. So they're not setting up that kid to be afraid and worried to have to go back to school. So they're, in a way, they're doing the best thing they can for that kid by saying, no, you have to go to school, even though it's kind of hellish and hard and it's upsetting to your OCD and everything like that. So we want to keep them in school. Um, but it's not what we consider to be typical school refusal, um, where a kid just decides they don't want to go to school. Um, and as parents, we know the nature of this illness and why they aren't attending. Um, so I, but I keep the slide in so you can show schools um, some of the reasons why they are not there. OCD, nature of the illness, fatigue, lack of sleep. Um, some may need to stay home to avoid exposure to germs. If we know that strep is running through the school, it may be better to keep them home for a week than consign them to a month or two of a pants flare. Um, again, that's going to need strong communication with you, your doctor, and the school to figure out what is the best thing to do for that student at that time. And then some of these kids, they have a lot of doctor's appointments. Um, some of these kids need a whole team of doctors. So they're for a while, you know, it shouldn't be the whole year that they're doing this, but there are going to be periods where they may have a whole cluster of appointments or they're out of school for IVIG um, for a couple of days of the week. And that's going to affect attendance too. Um, so here's my favorite word besides communication, flexibility. Um, we want to keep these kids in school. So if that means the school is going to adapt some of their homework needs, if that school should could be able to adapt whether or not they're in school all day, um, if they are having no REM sleep at night um, and they're just incredibly exhausted and they finally fall asleep at 4 a.m., maybe it's better for their healing to let them sleep and then come in at nine o'clock instead of seven o'clock. Um, again, working towards getting into school as much as possible. Um, so partial days, online learning, if that's available, I know that was easier and more used in COVID and it'll probably all go away by fall, but I'd like to think there'd be a perfect world where we could get some of them to keep doing it. And then if they've been out of school for a long time, just because they're ready to go back to school doesn't mean that they're at full 100% totally back to normal, back to baseline. They don't need any help. They may need a gradual re-entry. They may, we want to start with the thing that's going to make them successful. We want to get them going to school. We want them to want to go to school. So sometimes the alternative, you tell the teacher, well, they could not go to school at all, or we could amend some of their curriculum for a short period of time. Um, we don't necessarily want to do this the whole year, um, but if math is a big issue for them and they really don't like math for some reason, and they're trying to get out of school every single time when it comes towards math class, work with your CBT therapist and doing ERP and maybe starting with five minutes of math and then pulling them out of it and rewarding them for sticking it out for five minutes. And then in a few days or a week, moving them to 10 minutes and gradually getting back up to normalcy. Um, 
because trauma and past experiences can impact them. Um, and we, we just really want to be able to deliver the rest of the curriculum um, as much as possible. Okay. Um, educational supports. These are four slides that I'm not going to talk about in detail, um, especially if your schools really aren't going to implement them. But in the U, I keep them in here just as some of the, as an idea of what some schools in the United States are doing for these various different symptoms of pans pandas. Um, just like Dr. Sweeto had said, uh, when you are talking to a doctor, especially who you do not think is particularly pans pans literate or friendly, um, maybe it's best not to use the word pans pandas. So maybe at school, we're not using the word pans pandas. Maybe we're not even in your case using the word OCD or ticks. Um, and I don't know how much weight a doctor's note pulls in Italy. Um, and here it, it depends on the school. But instead of maybe, this is just an idea. So um, I don't know if it'll work, but it's just a best guess of what I would try to do. Um, maybe instead of mentioning OCD or PANS, um, you and the doctor might say something like, this student um, needs help transitioning between assignments due to mental health issues related to perfectionism, okay? So we know they have perfectionism because of their OCD, but we're not saying OCD. Um, please provide a timer um, so that student knows they must move from one task to the next. Then if the student is becoming increasingly upset or agitated, we want the school to provide him with a space to release his compulsions and take a break. Um, otherwise, his symptoms will not be manageable and he will miss school. So this strategy will accommodate some behaviors while providing support to teach the student to move past other behaviors in order to facilitate his ability to learn in school. So maybe we don't mention exactly the big umbrella terms, but the specific issues and a specific small support that may be find helpful and why um, and how the teacher can easily implement that into their typical school teaching routine, okay? Um, but like I said, I'm keeping all of them in here for you guys to be able to look at later um, if it is helpful. So just to recap, Collaboration is key between all school staff members, families, and doctors so that everyone is, who is working with the student is on the same page in terms of what is happening and why and how to best handle it. Um, professional development is critical. Pandas and PANS are complex uh, medical conditions and teachers, just like they learn about how to handle ADHD and autism um, and why it's happening and what they should do it, they should be learning about pants pandas too, um, because it is just as disruptive to a child's learning as any of these other issues. Um, schools need to remember that functioning of the student may change rapidly. Um, so flexible and appropriate modifications to schedule placement and curriculum may need to be made quickly. Um, so thinking in advance is gonna be very helpful. Um, we wanna prepare for attendance issues by offering um, different solutions like hybrid support or um, other strategies to keep them going into school. Um, we, and when they're ready to school, like to go back to school, if they've been out for a while, we just wanna gradually increase expectations. Um, so we need to plan for the worst and hope for the best. Um, to allow for fluid flow in and out of services because when they don't need support, they shouldn't be given the support. Um, these supports have to be individualized per student and per flare because remember, one symptom can manifest differently each flare in some kids. Um, because it's gonna impact multiple areas of functioning and learning, they're gonna need to weave in many layers of support throughout the day. Um, and it's important for them to remember that it takes a team sometimes to distinguish between choice-based behaviors and neurological symptoms. And then no matter what, positive strategies are generally more successful than negative ones. Um, and 
especially during the flare, it can be much more helpful to manage the antecedents to prevent a behavioral issues. So that's a good overview of what I would say to do at school. Um, I don't know, I don't quite know everything about your education system. So I hope it was helpful. Um, and you're always welcome to email me um, if you wanted to just sort of email about what's happening and I can try to come up with something for them. Um, usually those one-on-ones helps. I get a couple of other people involved too. So we, there's a turnaround time. Uh, it doesn't just happen overnight. So if you have a meeting tomorrow, I may, we may not be able to help you. So um, giving us some advanced time to give a little one-on-one -on -one support is definitely needed. Um, all right. I'm gonna stop the share. That's the end of that. Um, and we're done. I don't know if we there was if anybody had any specific questions that they wanted to try to fit in at the end that we could do. Um, so I leave that to the Italian committee. And if you do have a question, just make sure that you unmute yourself because everybody but Dr. Sweeto and I are muted at the moment. Stefania, I think you're muted. Yes, a couple of questions. So, yes, from uh, Dr. Suido. Um, it's just arrived these questions. So, so uh, one, once uh, the symptoms disappear, so maybe after two years that symptoms uh, disappear, uh, do you su suggest to suspend um, penicillin prophylaxis or not? And for most children, if they haven't had to have IVIG or plasmapheresis, uh, one year, certainly two years after their last uh, pandas pan symptoms is fine to stop the antibiotic. So in a child who we would treat in our IVIG protocol, we would ask them to continue antibiotics for at least a full year after any exacerbation. And then if they haven't had one for that year at all, you could consider stopping the antibiotic and just then monitor if the symptoms start coming back, do the cultures, try a week of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and you might not have to put the child back on antibiotics at that point. Mm -hmm. So another question. Yes, if a woman contracts strepto during uh, her pregnancy, uh, do you think there is a connection with pandas uh, uh, or maybe uh, the child can develop pandas uh, during, uh, after the birth? That's a great question. And I actually started my research um, on the relationship between Sydenham Korea and OCD looking at exactly that question, whether group B strep, which is the one you get during pregnancy, could um, make the child vulnerable to pans pandas. And the answer is absolutely not. The group B strep is an incredibly different organism from the group A uh, beta hemolytic strep. Uh, the family of streptococcal bacteria is almost as large as the family of mammals. So um, I always think of a group A and a group B are about as much as like as a person and a rhinoceros. They're, they're very different bugs. Okay. Okay, so um, as you can imagine, we have a lot of questions, uh, but maybe I can email you later or tomorrow and, and, and you can answer me uh, as a... Uh, Yes, that would be great. Yes, thank you. All thank right. you very much. You, you clarify us many, many things. So we are very thankful to you and um, hope, hope you see you in Italy very soon. <laughs> okay. Yes, Gabby and I will wait for the invitation. It would be lovely to, to be able to meet you in person. Okay.
thank, thank you, you so much, much indeed bye thank you very bye. much thank bye. You very bye bye ciao thank you ciao thank you, ciao. Thank you.